ketamine versus etomidate for rapid sequence intubation. Ask any ketamine-loving emergency physician how ketamine is made, and chances are you get some version of the story that ketamine is a careful distillate from an extract from the milk of lactating angels. And while ketamine may not be quite that pure, it's no secret that we in the emergency department, we love our ketamine. I've got a couple of articles to review that potentially call into question the perfection of our beloved ketamine. So I want to post this as a warning that some of the shine may be taken off of your beloved ketamine. Our basic understanding of the action of ketamine is that from a process of CNS stimulation, we get extra secretion of catecholamines at the neuromuscular junction, and we get delayed reuptake of those circulating catecholamines. This causes a ketamine bump where we get an increase in heart rate and an increase in blood pressure. We typically see this in our hemodynamically intact patients. For those patients that are not hemodynamically intact, that have a degree of physiologic impairment, there are lower levels of circulating catecholamines, so we get less of a ketamine bump in these patients. These physiologically bankrupt patients can have significant post-intubation hypotension or significant cardiovascular collapse. This two-patient case series is perhaps the scariest description of what happens when patients have no physiologic buffer and are exposed to the theoretical negative cardiovascular effects of ketamine. Two patients, one in his 20s with perforated bowel with sepsis, another 11-year-old with all of the hop killers, hypotension, hypoxia, and pH issues. They each received 2 and 2.4 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine for their RSI, and both had cardiac arrest within minutes of receiving their induction agents. My strategy to avoid this is to aggressively and carefully resuscitate my patients prior to their intubation by giving them an appropriate volume of an appropriate fluid and giving them an appropriate amount of an appropriate presser to get them as well-tuned as possible before pushing a reduced dose of my induction agent. Typically, in a delayed sequence intubation strategy, giving between 0.5 and 1 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, ensuring that that sedating dose is enough to get my patient's lights out, and then paralyzing them so, so I avoid any risk of awareness with intubation. I then intubate them and anticipate that they could still get hypotensive after their intubation. It's important to be aware that some induction agents are associated with post-intubation hypotension, but there are several other things, some of them reversible, that we need to be aware of if our patients crash after we intubate them. I use the Arshite mnemonic, acidosis, anaphylaxis, heart-related causes like tamponade and pulmonary hypertension, stacked breaths, hypovolemia, induction agent, which we're talking about today, tension pneumothorax, and electrolytes. First study we're going to look at was published in Academic Emergency Medicine 2020. It's a near cohort study. The National Emergency Airway Registry is a collection of about 25 academic emergency departments. To be a member of the near registry, you need to document at least 90% of your intubations. The problem with registry studies and data mining registry studies is that at best we can detect trends and we can use these studies as hypothesis generating studies without controlling for why the intubator chose to use either ketamine or automidate. It's impossible to parse out whether any of the patients in each group were particularly sicker than the patients in the other group. We don't know what made the intubator choose ketamine over automidate or vice versa. So there are significant limitations in registry studies. This first study seeks to describe ketamine versus automidate use across the near registry and to compare ketamine versus automidate outcomes in septic patients. In the calendar year 2016 and 2017, there were 12,700 intubations. Of those, 531 were deemed to have sepsis at the time the laryngoscope was in the hand of the intubator. 363 patients received automidate, 140 received ketamine. Across the study sites, some sites clearly loved ketamine and used it 92% of the time. 
some sites clearly didn't love ketamine and never used it. Primary outcome of the study was a systolic blood pressure less than 100 within 15 minutes of intubation. And in septic patients, 74% of those that received ketamine had a systolic blood pressure less than 100 within 15 minutes of the intubation. 50% of the patients that received etomidate had a systolic blood pressure less than 100 within 15 minutes of the intubation. Again, we don't know if either group was sicker than the other, and we don't know what made the intubator choose ketamine over etomidate. But observed rates of peri-intubation hypotension were higher in the ketamine group than the etomidate group. Vasopressor use within 15 minutes was also higher in the ketamine group versus the etomidate group. Between 23 and 27 percent of the patients were on pressors prior to their intubation. The authors aggressively conclude that these data call into question the widely held belief that ketamine is hemodynamically stable. A bigger take-home point, acknowledging the challenges in registry data, is to acknowledge that patients with sepsis are sick and are fragile, and that septic shock is a preload-dependent vasodilatory shock state with a sprinkling of cardiogenic shock. So these patients are at risk of decompensating when we switch them from spontaneous ventilation with negative inspiratory pressures to positive pressure ventilation, especially when we add on an induction agent that might turn off some of their endogenous catecholamine secretion. The study does not answer my big question, which is what about reducing the dose? Does that have an effect on rates of post-intubation hypotension? The study attempt to answer that question. The Kent Sussex Surrey Air Ambulance Group is in the southeast corner of England, just south of London, a little red dot on the map here. They looked to see what happened to their patients that were intubated with a reduced dose of ketamine in those patients that were physiologically impaired. They had traditionally used succinylcholine and atomidate, and if the intubator perceived that the patient was physiologically compromised, they would reduce their automidate dose to 0.15 milligrams per kilogram from 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Their standard induction ratio for hemodynamically intact pre-hospital trauma patients was three mics per kilo of fentanyl, two milligrams per kilogram of ketamine, and one milligram per kilogram of rock. They dropped this ratio to a one mic per kilo of fentanyl, one milligram per kilogram of ketamine, and one milligram per kilogram of rock heronium in their physiologically impaired patients. And they found no difference in the rates of post-intubation hypotension when compared to a standard dose and dose reduced strategy with succinylcholine and atomidate. So no difference in this small study of pre-hospital trauma patients in rates of post-intubation hypotension. Let's look now at all comers, not just septic patients, but all comers. Another near cohort study three-year registry, everyone in 2016, 2017, and 2018, looking at rates of peri-intubation hypotension in all intubations. Again, registry study, no randomized allocation to ketamine or automidate, so there is potential biases regarding how each agent was chosen. There's a sweet spot of blood pressure that they picked, and I'm not certain why they chose this Goldilocks range, but to be enrolled in this study, or to be selected from the vast archive of patients in the near registry, you had to have a systolic blood pressure greater than 100 and less than 140. They did look at ketamine, specifically at doses less than one milligram per kilogram and compared that to doses greater than one milligram per kilogram. Same thing for atomidate with a break point of 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. 19,000 patients in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Several thousand were removed for having blood pressures too high and too low, leaving 6,800 patients. 6,068 received atomidate, 738 received ketamine. Rates of post-intubation hypotension were observed to be higher in the ketamine group at 18.3% versus the atomidate group at 12.4%. 
Some of this could be explained by the fact that 19.9% of the patients in the ketamine group had sepsis versus 10.9% of patients in the automidate group. And we already know that within some of these patients that have already been studied in a different co different cohort, that their rates of post-intubation hypotension with sepsis are between 50 and 74%. Ketamine group was more likely to have difficult airway characteristics, 69.2% versus 60.4%. Their rates of peri-intubation hypoxia were not surprisingly higher at around 10% versus 7%. So the ketamine group here might be a little thicker. In trauma patients, there was no difference in the rates of peri-intubation hypotension if you were intubated for a traumatic cause. There was also no difference in dose reduced strategies versus standard dose strategies in either the ketamine group or the automidate group. And this surprised me. So my unanswered question is what do I do with my big sick patient who's obviously big sick, those patients that are older than their blood pressure. And then the other unanswered question is what do I do with my patients that are occultly unwell, who have a shock index, their heart rate over their blood pressure, greater than 0 0.9. This group of patients that we know can sometimes unravel after we intubate them. The authors of the second study give a more balanced summary and more balanced conclusion that we propose that clinicians should prioritize pre-intubation resuscitation over adjustments to sedative type and doses to optimize patient hemodynamics and outcomes. It's as if they're telling us to resuscitate, intubate, and anticipate. They also appropriately summarize that it seems prudent that patients who remain frankly unstable or in shock despite attempts to optimize hemodynamic status before intubation should receive lower induction doses. They agree with a dose-reduced strategy in those patients that are floridly big sick. So these two studies were registry studies. We've acknowledged that you cannot directly compare the performance of two drugs unless the allocation of those drugs is randomized because there will be subtle and not so subtle factors that the intubators and intubating clinicians use to choose those agents. So without a perfectly balanced group, we cannot accurately draw a conclusion that ketamine is either better or worse than automidate. We can probably conclude that ketamine is not perfect and ketamine certainly didn't hit it out of the park with a dramatically lower rate of peri-intubation hypotension. What we need is a randomized controlled trial where the intubator has no say in which agent they use and to then see what happens to blood pressures after that intubation. And the good people of France have come to our rescue here. There was a study in Lancet in 2009 that was a randomized controlled trial of ketamine versus automidate, primarily looking at ICU outcomes to determine whether Atomidate's mild adrenal suppressant effects had any long-term outcome on patient survival, but they did helpfully look at pre- and post-intubation blood pressures. The way the study was set up, they wanted the ICU clinicians to not know which agent was used in the intubation of their patients. French have a very advanced pre-hospital system where you're getting ICU-level care pre-hospitally, so a lot of these intubations that were performed pre-hospitally were performed by intensivists. Patients were intubated either pre-hospitally or in an emergency department. The intubator was told to either use ketamine or automidate, and that allocation was randomized. After that, the intubation agent was hidden from the treating clinicians, and the primary outcome was a mean maximum SOFA score. 689 patients were intubated during the study period. 12 met their pre-specified exclusion criteria. 22 patients, the treating physician refused to enroll them in the study. They were trying to find a really sick cohort of patients. So they deliberately excluded anyone that was discharged from the, from the ICU within three days. They also excluded anyone that died before reaching the hospital because they needed in-hospital SOFA scores. So they found a sweet spot of super sick, but not dead patients. 234 versus 235 patients received automidate versus ketamine. 16% of the population had sepsis, 
they found no difference in their primary outcome of mean maximum SOFA scores throughout the ICU stay. When we compare their pre- and post-intubation blood pressures by subtracting the post-intubation blood pressure from the pre-intubation blood pressure, there was no difference in rates of peri-intubation hypotension between the two groups. The average drop in blood pressure for the automatate group was 5. The average drop in blood pressure for the ketamine group was 10, with a similar range of anywhere from a drop in 30 points to a bump of 11 points in the automatate group, compared to a drop in 33 points to a bump of 10 points in the ketamine group. So no difference in the rates of peri-intubation hypotension when the induction agent was randomly allocated to each group. So this is the cleanest data we have to answer that question. Take on points. In registry data that is admittedly flawed, the observed rates of post-intubation hypotension seem higher in a ketamine group compared to an automatate group. The bigger take home point is that in septic patients that are intubated, rates of post-intubation hypotension are 50% or higher. So we need to appropriately and aggressively resuscitate those patients before we intubate them. In the only randomized controlled trial comparing ketamine and automidate, there is no difference in post-intubation hypotension rates. Ketamine lasts longer than automidate. So in a patient that has a surgically inevitable airway and where that surgical inevitable surgically inevitable airway occurs 10 minutes after the push of the induction agent, having that patient appropriately sedated and still having analgesia on board is better for that patient. For that reason, I will still use ketamine. In big sick patients that are hemodynamically impaired, it's reasonable to use a lower dose of your induction agent and to use a DSI strategy so that you know that that patient is appropriately sedated before they're paralyzed. And to then still proceed with caution when you intubate them because rates of post-intubation hypotension are very high, especially in our septic population. Resuscitate, intubate, and anticipate. Thank you.